million dollars in, in carbon accordance tax with promotion. Standing order Where are 43, the time for member statements has concluded. Are there any questions without notice? The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I remind her of the Treasurer's failure to deliver the promised surplus this financial year, his failure to collect more than 10 per cent of the promised $9 billion in mining tax revenue, and his failure to deliver on his promise to create at least 500,000 new jobs in two years. And I ask, does the Prime Minister still have confidence in her Treasurer? <laughs> The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. And to the Leader of the Opposition, the answer is of course. And to the Leader of the Opposition, too. I know, uh, I know he is not Order. interested in or competent with economics, and I know that the Opposition is desperately trying to pretend that the Leader of the Opposition is interested in economic matters. But I'd suggest to the Leader of the Opposition, if he's engaging in this pretense, don't come in and criticise the person. Deal with the facts. And the facts of the Australian economy are these. Unlike economies around the world, we have low unemployment, low inflation, low interest rates. We are triple A rated by all three major credit rating, ratings agencies. We have strong public finances. And during the worst downturn in more than 80 years, during the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, we kept creating jobs. And we kept creating jobs because this government, including the Treasurer, to who the Leader of the Opposition refers, because this government put jobs first. Now, I understand that the Leader of the Opposition, if he had been in government, would have taken a different decision to Treasurer Wayne Swan. He would not have put the jobs of 200,000 Australians first. He would have consigned them to the unemployment queue. He would not now be getting our economy ready for the challenges of the future. He would not be embracing a clean energy future. He would not be embracing the digital economy. He would not be laying out a strategy for us to tap into the growth in our region, the Asian region. He would not be revolutionising this nation's approach to skills and to schools to ensure that we win the economic race by winning the education race. He would not be engaged in economic policies of those depth and that complexity. I understand that. But because this government has focused on jobs, we have more than 800,000 Australians in jobs that have been created since this government came to office. Because we are investing now for the future, Australians can look forward to a future in which we will see strength and fairness and prosperity in our nation. We will see us harvest the benefits of being a smarter country. Now, none of this future is assured. To get there, you've got to make the right choices. This government, including the Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer, uh, the member for Lilly, are making those right choices. If the Leader of the Opposition has an alternate plan, then table it. He's had more than enough opportunity as Leader of the Opposition to do it, but I suspect we will never see that. Instead, we will continue to see this personal criticism. The Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary. Yes, a supplementary to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister rule out redesigning the mining tax, which was the Treasurer's own handiwork? The Prime Order. The Prime Minister has the call. The Prime Minister has the call, and I was waiting to give her the call until I had silence from those who asked the question. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And the answer to the Leader of the Opposition's question is as follows. Uh, first, the Leader of the Opposition, if he spent any time following economic matters, if he in any way studied the economic debate, uh, would know that we have been critical of the reckless approach of state governments to royalties. Interestingly enough, the opposition that has always criticised an efficient profits-based tax in the mineral sector has gone tick, tick, tick 
tick to Liberal royalty increases around the country. We have been concerned about increases in these inefficient taxes, and we've asked the GST Distribution Review to look at the matter. Uh, we've received their conclusions, and they are that the current treatment of royalties under the MRRT is both unsustainable and undesirable. That's a reference to what state governments, state Liberal governments, are doing. And uh, so we've said that through the heads of treasury process, we would work on that with state counterparts in coming months. If the leader of the Order. opposition in any way kept up with economic matters and economic debate, he would be well aware of that. The leader of the opposition should also recognise, of course, that a profits-based tax is more efficient than royalties. And if he is concerned about these questions, then he should take them up with state Liberal counterparts. The member for Greenway has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What is the government doing to ensure the rights of Australian workers, particularly working mums, are protected? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank, oh, thank you very much. And I thank the member for Greenway for her question. And she is someone who knows uh, firsthand from her own experiences about the challenges of balancing work and family life and is doing a great job uh, balancing work and family life and representing in this parliament uh, her constituency of Greenway. And uh, the member for Greenway, like all Labor members, knows uh, that the purpose of our political party, formed more than 100 years ago, has been to provide fairness and decency to working people, and particularly fairness and decency in workplaces. That's why, across the life of the Labor Party, we have fought for fairness and decency at work, and no more important or ferocious fight than the fight we engaged in against work choices. We fought the Liberal Party's work choices because it was unfair to every Australian worker. We fought the Liberal Party's work choices because it particularly hit women and young workers. And most particularly when we look at the statistics for women, uh, women on Work Choices AWAs were earning $87 less a week than women on collective agreements. This had been a stinging attack against the rights of working women. Indeed, there were celebrated cases like six mums who worked at a mushroom farm who were sacked after they refused to sign up to Australian workplace agreements with a 25 per cent pay cut. And I understand those interjecting supported all of that. Now, in contrast, we got rid of work choices because of that attack on Australian workers, particularly women. And we understand that with the new fair work system, it's important that we keep modernising because the needs of modern families change. The pressures to balance work and family life change over time. So having been the first government in this country to introduce a right to request flexible working conditions, we are Manager intending to business. extend that right. We are intending to extend that right to workers who are returning from parental leave, because when you've just had a new child, then needing flexibility in your working conditions is one of the ways that will help you balance work and family life. We will also be extending that right uh, to people who are uh, caring for it's there for people who are caring for kids at school. We want to extend that right to people who are in all sorts of difficult circumstances, including particularly women uh, who may be dealing with domestic violence, are changing their family arrangements as a result, and are in a particular time of strain for their family. This is an important change for Australian workers, and we will ensure that we deliver it as part of our fair work Prime system, Minister's having got rid of work choices. Expired. The member for North Sydney has the call. My question is to the Treasurer. I remind the Treasurer that the mining tax has raised $126 million in its first six months, and it was budgeted uh, for a billion over that period. Given that the tax office has spent over $50 million administering the tax, will the Treasurer now face reality, admit defeat and join with the Coalition to abolish this failed tax? Yeah. The Treasurer has the call. 
Yes, look, I do uh, thank the Shadow Treasurer for that question, which goes to the purpose uh, of the MRRT, but it also goes to the revenue forecasts. And I wish to address the, revenue, the question of revenue forecasts uh, immediately. The member for Higgins might take responsibility for observing the standing orders. The Treasurer has the call. Implicit in the Shadow Treasurer's question is somehow that Treasury forecasts can never change. And the fact is they do change frequently. In fact, we bring down a budget, we bring down an update, and of course they are then matched against revenue heads as they come in monthly. There's nothing unusual about this. For example, uh, when those opposite were in power, revenue was adjusted upwards by massive amounts. Unexpected. Rivers of gold, over $300 billion in something like three years. Those forecasts were adjusted. Now, the truth is this, that at the end of last year and through the second half of last year, there was a dramatic collapse in commodity prices. A dramatic collapse. And that collapse in commodity prices has impacted upon profits. And when profits go up, resource rent taxes go up. And when profits come down, resource rent taxes come down. Now, of course, those opposite have always opposed a resource rent tax. Any amount of revenue from a resource rent tax is a direct affront to those opposite who go down on bended knee to their mining billionaire friends. So let's be very clear that they don't support resource rent taxes. And in fact, if the attitude that is being expressed over there were to have to prevail over the last 25 years, we would never have had a PRRT, which has now raised $28 billion. But that resource rent tax was opposed by those opposite, just as this resource rent tax is now being opposed by those opposite. So the truth is that prices have come down dramatically, but as the tax commissioner said in his note on Friday, a partial recovery of commodity prices has been reflected in a partial recovery in revenue. Now the fact is that this country needs a resource rent tax for our children and our grandchildren. Everyone on this side of the House is proud of the fact that we understand that the Australian people own our mineral resources 100 per cent and we are all entitled to some of the super profits that flow from those. The attitude of those opposite is to get down on bended knee to the mining billionaires, get down on bended knee. So what we are seeing here is another misrepresentation and attack on good public policy to hide, to hide the fact that they have a vicious attack on the living standards of working Australians planned by getting rid of the, the tripling of the tax free threshold by knocking off this The member for North Sydney on a supplementary. The member for North Sydney. Has my the question call. is to the treasurer. Given that the treasurer has redesigned the mining tax already on five occasions, will he now rule out redesigning the tax again before the election on the 14th of September? The treasurer has the call. As the uh, Prime Minister indicated before, there's already a process in place going through the federal treasury and state treasuries to look at the issue of royalties. That was announced following the, tre the finance minister's met meeting, the treasury meeting at the end of last year. But apparently, this is another fact, another fact that the shadow treasurer is not aware of. The fact is, as I said before, a dramatic impact in terms of commodity prices on the revenue, a somewhat small recovery in the revenue as a consequence of a small recovery in commodity prices. What I said on Friday, and I'll say it again, is that we will look at the performance of this tax in light of prices in a normal the way for North by Sydney our has asked his and, of course, by the tax department. The member for Karangamite has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations, Financial Services and Superannuation. Will the minister update the House on the government's plans to improve flexibility and fairness for working families? Uh, how, are there any obstacles to these plans? The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations has the call. I thank the member for Crangramite for his question because he knows, as everyone on this side of the House knows, Labor is always up front about what we're going to do in workplace relations. Yeah. See, on this side of the house, we believe in work-life family balance. 
On this side Order. of the House, we believe in cooperation between employees and employers. On this side of the House, we believe in flexible workplaces. We believe in productive workplaces. That is why I'm pleased to advise the member for Krangamite that Labor will extend the national employment standards, which provide the right to request flexible work arrangements to more Australian workers. The sort of workers who are going to benefit from what we've just announced are carers, are parents of school-aged children, are mature-age workers, are the victims of domestic violence and those who seek to help them. We've also announced yesterday that we intend to provide better roster protection for people who experience sudden changes to their rosters, which upset family arrangements, which cause great harm at home. The reason why we're doing these things is because Labor understands that we live in a changing world. We know that the Menzies DLP vision of Dad going to work nine to five, of a pipe at home, of Mum not working, that doesn't describe most modern families anymore. We understand that the world has changed, unlike the policy of those opposite. We know that women are participating in the workforce more than ever. We know that fathers want to spend more time with their families. We know that people with disabilities and carers want into the workforce. We understand that families come in all shapes and sizes. This is a positive view of encouraging people to participate and creating good jobs in the future. But the problem is that there's only one side of Australian politics who wants to be positive about workplace relations. See, whenever we talk about workplace relations, someone in central bunker Liberal headquarters presses the alarm button. And they say, quick, we better get out and bash some unions. We better disguise the fact that we do not have a policy for Australian workplaces. Even better, someone in Liberal Party headquarters presses the button, quick, let's rake over something 20 years ago as a revenge against our Prime Minister, because at least we talk about workplace relations. I'll tell you about Liberal flexibility. I'll tell you about Liberal flexibility because they won't. Under Liberals, it's more flexible to sack someone. It's more flexible to cut their pay. It's more flexible that they don't have job security. Under Labor, our definition of flexibility is productivity. It's modern families getting a decent go in the workplace. I love it. I love it when Tony Abbott, when the Leader of the Opposition, reminds everyone, as he did today, he's the worker's best friend. With friends like him, you don't need enemies. The member for Karangamite on a supplementary. Uh, Order! Thank you. Order! Yeah, and I'm not very happy with the member for Goldstein, though. The member for Karangamite has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, on my supplementary question, what other ways is the government supporting working Australians to build their prosperity? And what level of support is there for the government's plans? The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations has the call and will be heard in silence. Labor is doing a lot to promote prosperity in this country. That is why we have seen, while Labor has been in office, the creation of 850,000 jobs. But we know, we know that there's a group of people in Australia who want to hold our prosperity back. Who would these people be? They'd be people who don't support the automotive industry. They'd be people who don't support the national broadband network. They'd be people who've never met a public servant they didn't want to sack. There is a clear choice in prosperity. But it isn't just it's your policies, Julie. It's not the personal. The of the opposition is but when we come, when and, we the, come, and the minister will the not, for curtains. The member for curtains. will not take interjections and will refer to people by their correct titles. The minister has the call. Well, the next, the next challenge to prosperity, of course, is the crazy idea to cut, to reintroduce a tax on the superannuation of 3.6 million low-paid Australians. Whoever dreamed that up in the opposition should get a one-way ticket out of the joint. We are the people who want to cut the tax of low-paid working people by cutting their superannuation, and only one group in Australian pilot, you might not like the truth over there, but you shouldn't have it. And finally, though, when we talk about prosperity and threats to it, I love a good leader of the opposition quote. What Mr Abbott said, talking about work choices, he said, the Howard government's industrial legislation was good for wages, it was good for jobs, it was good for workers, and let's never forget about it. I tell you one thing, we'll never forget about it, but I don't agree with the rest of that quote. The member for Groove has the call. 
Order. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and my question is to the Treasurer. I remind the Treasurer of his statement on Friday that the mining tax failed to raise enough revenue because, and I quote, iron ore prices fell, so a very dramatic drop in commodity prices was reflected in a drop in revenue. Is the Treasurer aware that iron ore spot prices have in fact increased by about $30 a tonne since his own budget outlook, an increase of almost 25 per cent? Order. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, and, uh, it's I'm, I'm absolutely aware of it. And uh, what I would like to say to, uh, to the member is he ought to be aware that it takes months for spot prices to flow through to MRRT revenues. It is not the case that you have a spot price on one day and it's reflected in the MRRT the revenues the next, as the member has sought to imply. That is just simply factually incorrect. And yet another example of the extent to which all of those opposite will go to misrepresent the basic facts, yeah, yeah. not just of revenue in the case of the MRRT, but the basic facts about our economy. And one of the reasons we're seeing so much bitterness, one of the, one of the reasons we're seeing so much aggression from those opposite about these questions of modelling, about these questions of forecasts and about these questions of revenue is that they are still smarting from the fact that two years ago they were sprung. They were sprung by our forecasters, they were sprung by our advisers with an $11 billion hole in their election package, which they had deliberately tried to hide from the Australian people right through the whole election campaign. And that is why we have seen in this House, and particularly from the Shadow Treasurer, a constant campaign against the advisers. They're carrying on as if somehow, somehow all of these forecasts have all been done by the government. Nothing to do with our advisers, nothing to do with the fact that we are advised by the same professional public servants that they were advised by. Now, the truth is that we have been through one of the most volatile periods in the Australian economy and in the global economy in over 80 years. And for political purposes, they seek to deny that. They seek to deny the global financial crisis. They seek to deny that there was an $11 billion hole in their election costings, the biggest bungle in Australian political history when it comes to election costings. That's why they are so embarrassed. And that is why they are conducting these sorts of campaigns about the forecasts which are provided in a responsible way to this government. And it is also why they are so embarrassed about the fact that this government has been prepared to make the, the big calls on the economy. Resume the big calls seat. On the Treasurer will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Well, Madam Speaker, the Treasurer was asked about the mining tax forecast. He's talked almost exclusively about the opposition. I'd ask you to bring him back to the, the question. Of he was in fact will resume his seat. The treasurer has the, the treasurer has the call. The treasurer has the call. The manager of opposition business is warned. Everyone on this side of the house is proud that we've made the big calls on the economy and we've got them right. And on that side of the house, you have got them comprehensively wrong. If you would have had your way during the global financial crisis, unemployment would have been through the roof and we wouldn't be talking about solid growth and job creation in the Australian economy. Now, all of, all of the, the behaviour from those opposites is all about camouflage. The Treasurer's time has expired. The member for Dobell has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Minister, there is strong support in my part of the Central Coast for a large regional airport. Does the government support the concept of the region having its own airport? And if so, what are the next steps in establishing a regional airport on the Central Coast? The Minister for Infrastructure and Transport has the call. Um, I thank the member for Dobell for his question. Indeed, I have met with him and the former mayor, Bob Graham, about the proposal for an airport to service the region of the Central Coast and the Lower Hunter. Indeed, the uh, joint study uh, conducted with the New South Wales government found that there would be over a million people living on the Central Coast and Lower Hunter region over the next 25 years, and that as a result of that population growth, 
as a stimulus to the local economy supporting jobs, that increased aviation capacity would be required. That's why the government has agreed to examine strategy, including the Wallara site, uh, which is in uh, the members' electorate for Wyong, which would be a, uh, a small uh, airport due to the size that of the land that would be available, according to the council, but would be able to service uh, that region. Of course, uh, the member would be aware that this would not alleviate the need for a second airport for Sydney in order to secure jobs, ensure economic growth and Sydney's position as a global city. Uh, as part of the study that's being undertaken, we're investigating uh, whether Richmond RAF base could fulfil some capacity as an interim measure with limited civilian operations. Uh, what we're seeing is enormous growth in aviation. Uh, 64 million passengers uh, 10 years ago has grown to 111 million passengers during the last full financial year. What that doubling means is that there will be an increased demand for aviation as a result of aviation's critical role as a driver of national economic growth, as a driver of jobs and as a driver of Australia's position in a global economy. Because Sydney has four out of every ten movements, the capacities constraints at KSA are a handbrake on the national economy. And I note uh, the comments of the Shadow Minister, and I welcome his comments, uh, acknowledging that there is a need for bipartisanship uh, on this issue, that there is a need for this issue to be dealt with. Uh, it has been a political football for a long time. But we do need to deal with this issue. Uh, there is uh, substantial support amongst uh, many communities for the jobs and economic growth that aviation activity brings. And I look forward to working with uh, the members on the Central Coast uh, about these issues into the future. The member for Deakin has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline the importance of investing in jobs and growth and supporting Australians in their workplaces? The Treasurer has the call. Yes, I do thank the member for Deakin uh, for that question, because this government puts jobs and growth at the heart of its agenda every single day. In fact, that's what we did during the global financial crisis to ensure that Australia avoided the full force of the global financial crisis and the global recession. And by doing that, we avoided the permanent skills destruction that has caused so much damage to people and communities right across the developed world. Here, uh, we have got low unemployment and we've created over 800 and 50,000 jobs. And of course, if you looked at what has happened across other developed economies, massive unemployment, millions and millions of people out of work. And as we've been handling those situations in the global economy, we've been concentrating on an agenda to lift productivity, to create the high-skilled, high-wage jobs of the future. That's what our investment in infrastructure has been all about. It's what the NBN is about. So what our investment in innovation has been all about. It's about reforms to the tax system and, most particularly, tripling the tax-free threshold. Now, all of that has produced a situation where our economy is now 13 per cent larger than it was prior to the global financial crisis, with 850,000 jobs created over that period. And our concern is that to use this prosperity so we can support working Australian families, modern Australian families that need access to affordable health and education, modern Australian families that want dignity in their retirement. And that's why we put in place one of the most significant increases in the age pension, and it is indeed why we are so committed to compulsory superannuation. It's why we've tripled the tax-free threshold, so important that for work incentives and cost of living relief for many people on the lowest incomes. And that's why we've been committed to the school kids bonus for 1.3 million families to assist them with the cost of sending their kids to school. And of course, there's a real contrast here with the actions of those opposite. They want to rip away up to $500 from the superannuation accounts of 3.6 million Australians. And of course, they've opposed the increase in the superannuation guarantee, which goes to all working Australians. And Joe can tweet what he likes. He came into this House 
and oppose the increase in the superannuation guarantee. And of course, we know they want to rip out the tripling of the tax-free threshold, another savage attack on those on low incomes and low wages. Because we know that when it comes to working Australians, they always bow down to the feet of the fortunate few. Now, I heard that the Leader of the Opposition claimed this morning that he was a friend of the workers. Well, God help the workers if he's a friend of theirs. The architects of work choices, the architects of this savage attack coming right now against low-income Australians. And the member for Casey is waiting for you to be silent so he can get the call. The member for Casey has the call. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is also to the Treasurer. And I refer the Treasurer to his statement of 27 October 2011, when he said, and I quote, the revenue from the mining tax will be spread right across the country. Given that the mining tax has raised just $126 million in its first six months, can the Treasurer confirm that when he stated he would spread the benefits of the mining boom, he really meant $5.50 for every Australian? The member for Casey will resume his seat. The Treasurer has the call. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Well, you can tell how embarrassed the member was with that ridiculous question. What we've got here, completely. What, what and this I will demonstrates... give you 94A to leave the chamber. The member for Casey will leave the chamber. The Treasurer has the call. The Treasurer has the call. Speaker, I was saying before that the attitude that has been taken today is similar to the attitude that uh, their predecessors took with the PRRT. Now, the PRRT was opposed tooth and nail by vested interests by the Liberal Party. But it's raised $28 billion. Now, they kept it. They kept it. They didn't come into government and say, oh, we'll get rid of it. So what we've seen again is that they're opposing the MRRT. The MRRT, which is an important long-term reform for Australia to make sure that Australians get a fair share of the mineral wealth they own 100 per cent. Now, it just so happens that its introduction has coincided with a bout of global volatility towards the end of last year, which had a dramatic impact on commodity prices. A very dramatic impact on commodity prices. This was not an impact on commodity prices that was forecast by anyone in the private sector, by any of the companies, and it most certainly wasn't forecast by our official forecasters. But they should at least acknowledge that it has had a dramatic impact on revenue, and that's what the government has acknowledged. But what they won't acknowledge also is that in the second half of last year, it wasn't just the PRRT, the MRRT, it was company tax, capital gains tax and so on. All of them took a very significant hit from this global volatility. And the reason this is so important and the reason this debate demonstrates just how dangerous those opposite would be if they were running the country is this. What they are saying is to make up for this revenue whole, if you like, that has emerged because of all of these circumstances, they'd take the axe to the social safety net and put a sledgehammer through our economy. That's how reckless they are. And of course, we heard in the House last week the retrospective approach they would have taken during the global financial crisis, where they came in here and effectively said during the crisis they would have cut to the tune of $160 billion, which was the revenue write-down. Well, where would the Australian economy be today if they had been in charge and done that? So what all this demonstrates is just how dangerous they are, because they're in denial with the most basic facts that go to the core of Australia's prosperity and economic success over the past five years. The ability of a government to, to move in and protect people and protect families, understanding the volatility in a global economy. Lives depend on that. But those opposite are a dangerous alternative because they don't understand the basic facts of our economy Treasurer's and if they are in charge, they take a sledgehammer. The member for Morton has the call. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families, Community Services, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform. How is the government helping Australian working families balance their work and family responsibilities? The Minister for Families, Community Service, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I thank the member for Morton uh, very much for his question. Uh, I certainly know he understands in his own uh, family life uh, what so many other families face, the daily juggle of getting their kids uh, up and ready for school as mum and dad get ready for work, uh, dropping them off at school and at childcare. And of course, this government also understands those challenges, and that's why we've been determined to support families as they, they make their choices every single day. It's why it was left to this government to deliver Australia's first national paid parental leave scheme, a national paid parental leave scheme that has now delivered to 260,000 families in this country and in the electorate of Morton in Brisbane, around 1,600 families have benefit, benefited from our paid parental leave scheme, making sure that families get the choice to stay at home with their newborn baby and get that extra financial support with their bills. And of course, it was this government that delivered dad and partner pay just six yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Six weeks ago, uh, we delivered dad and partner pay so that dads too can have some time off work to spend uh, that precious couple of weeks at the, at the start of their baby's life and also get some financial support with their bills. And since uh, the 1st of January this year, we've seen around 6,000 dads apply for dad and partner pay. So 6,000 dads are getting uh, the help that they need to spend time at home with their newborn babies. And of course, we know that um, as children uh, grow, families need that flexibility of work. And we've heard from the Prime Minister today about how this Labor government will make sure that as children grow and as parents uh, juggle their work and family responsibilities, we make sure that families have as much flexibility as possible to juggle those responsibilities. What we also know is that those opposite don't support the choices that families are make, making. It's this government that's delivered the school kids bonus and those opposite, of course, don't trust the choices that families are making. They want to take the school kids' bonus back because they don't trust how families are spending the money. And of course, it was this leader of the opposition who said, when he was a minister, that he would introduce, uh, he would see paid parental leave introduced over his dead body. Well, no wonder, no wonder parents don't trust anything he says. Now he says he's got the idea of paying wealthy women $75,000 to have a baby. The well, parents don't trust anything he expired. says. The member for Wannan has the call. My question is to the Treasurer. Given that we now know that the mining tax has cost $50 million to collect and only raised $126 million in its first six months, yet is linked to $15 billion worth of expenditure, does the Treasurer agree with financial commentator George Megalogenis, who said of the Treasurer yesterday, and I quote, you're almost in idiot territory if you're spending the money the ahead of its receipt. The time has expired. Yeah. The Treasurer has the call. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Well, first of all, I want to make the point that all of the policies are fully costed in our budget and fully reflected in our budget bottom line. And I know those opposite find that uh, highly embarrassing because we are delivering for Australia across the regions of this country some of the most important projects that Australians have been waiting for for a long time. For example, in Perth, the Gateway Project is being delivered. So I just think that those opposite might want to just take breath a bit here, because what we have been doing is putting in place some fundamental investments across our economy. I know they're highly embarrassed by the fact that they opposed the instant asset write-off, which has been a massive boon for small business in our community. And in fact, that's the policy they're going to take to the next election. 
to get rid of it, to get rid of that for hundreds of thousands of small businesses. I know they are highly embarrassed by that as well. So I'd just be a bit careful when you're seeking to make your political points about what you are committing yourself to. A major attack on small business, a major attack on superannuation, on something like 8 million Australians with superannuation. That's what you're committing yourself to, in addition, in addition to getting rid of the tripling of the tax-free threshold. You can see the realisation starting to dawn on a couple of the faces over there at what a sledgehammer those opposite are planning the for, for the Australian economy, for small businesses and for the Australian workforce. The member for Wakefield has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Inclusion, Mental Health and Ageing and the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. What is the government doing to support older people, families and carers to achieve the best possible balance between working, caring and social engagement? The Minister for Social Inclusion and Ageing has the call. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for Wakefield, my colleague from South Australia, for his question. Speaker, late in his prime ministership, John Howard bowed to the bleeding obvious and declared the work-life balance issues of Australia to be a barbecue stopper. Uh, and he was right. The trouble was, of course, that he then did precious the little of May substance. Has already been warned. Then did precious little of substance to help Australian barbecues run more smoothly. No paid parental leave. No real attention to childcare policy, and certainly no thought to the industrial issues involved, unless, of course, you count work choices. By contrast, this government has acted where the last government just talked, and we intend to keep building on those achievements. But while the public and the media debate has tended to focus on the needs of Australian families with young children in this regard, we also know that a good work life balance is an increasing challenge for older Australians. Australians over 55 are bearing greater care and responsibilities than ever before, often for their ageing parents as well as for their own children or sometimes their grandchildren. And this is happening at a time when Australia is relying more and more on increased workforce participation by this same group. Indeed, around a quarter of the total growth in Australia's workforce last decade was by an increase in the number of Australians working into their 60s. While the total workforce grew over that period by about 25 per cent, the number of men in their 60s working grew by 110 per cent, and the number of women working in their 60s grew by an astounding 200 per cent. But older workers often don't want to continue the work arrangements they had when they were younger. They want to have more flexibility in their work, flexibility to take advantage of healthy early retirement or semi-retirement year. And obviously, flexibility to deal with their growing caring responsibilities. Indeed, the ABS tells us that there are as many as one million older workers who want to move from full-time work to part-time work before they retire. And giving those Australians the flexibility and the right to formally request flexible work arrangements from their employer isn't just the proper thing to do for a cohort that has worked so hard for so long. It's also now an economic imperative. Speaker, extending the right to request flexible work to Australians over 55 was a direct recommendation of the advisory panel to the government on the economic potential of senior Australians. It's the right decision, and it's a decision that deserves the support of the entire parliament. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Cook has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I alert the Prime Minister to the government's latest estimate that spending on boat arrivals will fall by almost $2 billion over the forward estimates. On their assumption, the boats will stop. Given there were 17,270 illegal arrivals in 2012 and the trend is only going up, why is this promise any more believable than her promise to deliver a surplus? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And to the uh, member's question, 
Uh, first and foremost, the uh, member raises the issue about the budget. We spent some time in question time last week and indeed today uh, on issues associated with the budget and the inability of the opposition uh, to recognise there was a global financial crisis, the biggest economic disturbance since the Great Depression, and of course uh, that this had implications for the global economy, put millions of people out of work around the world, that it's had implications too for the budget, uh, writing down revenues by $160 billion. Well, the uh, question Prime referred Minister to budget will return. surplus, I'm addressing The Prime Minister that. will resume his seat. The member for Cook on a point of order. Yes. Thank you. Madam Speaker, on, on a point of relevance, my question was about their the forecast $2 billion for cut in spending. You should answer that question. The member for Cook understands that abuses of points of order will not be tolerated. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I am addressing the question as it was initially asked, uh, where the member absolutely and specifically referred to a budget surplus. I'm dealing with questions associated with the budget. If he's misdrafted his question, that's a matter for him. And I am making the point that if the member is genuinely interested in matters associated with the budget, then he would, of course, uh, unlike those who proffer economic commentary on behalf of the opposition, have to recognise that we've lived through the biggest global economic event since the Great Depression, that around the world tens of millions of people have been thrown out of work, that whilst we have come through that with low inflation and low unemployment, strong public finances and economic growth and a AAA rating, it's had implications for our budget, particularly a $160 billion write-off of revenue. And as a result, of course, the government is making decisions which continue to prioritise jobs and growth because we believe that is important and we always will put the jobs of working Australians first. Uh, the member, as well as asking very generally about the budget, also specifically referred to budget matters and uh, uh, asylum seekers uh, and arrivals. I would remind the member that if he uh, wants to look at these questions, then it would pay to deal with the facts. I remind him that the government has returned about a thousand people. The member to for Cook is warned. Uh, the government has returned about a thousand people to Sri Lanka since the 13th of August. That's many more than the Howard government ever did in as short a period of time. This is part of the way in which the government is addressing asylum seeker issues, and consequently, the member, rather than waving around pieces of paper, may want to deal credibly with the facts in this debate. The member for Parramatta has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Will the Minister update the House on the government's plan to make every school a great school and to give every student in every school access to a great education? And is the Minister aware of the impact of not acting to reform school funding? The Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth has the call. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for Parramatta for that question. In her electorate, over $100 million seeing improvements or upgrading of 32 classrooms, 16 libraries, 17 multi-purpose halls. And so it goes from the investment that this Labor government makes in education, because we know that it is the single most important investment we can make in the nation's future. And we know that by properly investing in education, we enable children to reach their full potential get high-paid jobs in the future and, of course, contribute to productivity. And that's why, after inheriting a system that had suffered from a decade of neglect by the coalition when in government, we worked with states and territories to provide more information to parents through the MySchool website, to lift the quality of teaching, to improve literacy and numeracy results through national partnerships in smarter schools, uh, to improve facilities in schools right across the nation to bring a national curriculum in, set at the very highest levels to give our kids the best chance that we can. And every time I visit a school, I see this proud investment in place. But the fact is, Speaker, there's more to do. The Gonski Review found that the model for funding our schools was broken, and it found that too many Australian kids 
are getting left behind. And that's why we've developed a national plan for school improvement, to deliver extra funding for schools that need it, based on the needs of every student in every single school. Delivering the reforms that we know will lift results, improve teacher training, better teaching, more local decision making, more teachers' aid, special equipment, those things that are needed now in the classroom to make a difference to the kids' education for the future. And we will pay our fair share. We expect the states to do likewise. And we have a plan to put Australia in the top five nations in the world by 2025. And that means Australian parents can be confident that their kids can get those high paid, high performing jobs of the future. Now, I'm asked about the impact of doing nothing on school funding by the member. And the fact is, if we don't act on school funding, and certainly that is the position that the opposition has taken, then not only will education performance around Australia continue to struggle, but Australian students will get less resources for their education in the future. To be clear, if we stick to the broken funding model that we now have, then Australian schools are likely to be worse off to the tune of around $5 billion. So it's very disappointing for Australian parents to see the Leader of the Opposition cutting the school kids' bonus, even more disappointing to see the Shadow Minister declare that a plan to make Australia a stronger and smarter and the much more intelligent country is mad. We will deliver a national plan for school improvement. The member for Fadden has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to report that the draft defence white paper states, and I'll quote, a strong national economy is fundamental to a strong defence force. An economic surplus is Australia's best defence against the uncertain global outlook. Prime Minister, why, according to your own draft defence white paper, have you now placed Australia's national security at risk by breaking your promise to deliver a surplus in 12-13? Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And to the member's question, first, I'm not going to speculate about an early, incomplete departmental working document that has neither been presented to government nor circulated to other relevant agencies, but has apparently been leaked to the media. It goes without saying that the defence white paper will be released, as the government has announced, and the member, when it is released, may want to study that white paper. On the question of the defence budget, can I be very clear with the House and with the member who has asked the question? Uh, we were the first government to budget over $100 billion for defence, and again this year we've budgeted $103 billion across the forward estimates. That's part of making the right decisions for national security. And a little bit earlier this year, I had the opportunity to outline the first ever national security strategy for the nation. And I would refer the member to that. I would also refer the member to the fact that the opposition uh, in the area of defence has made a series of completely inconsistent statements about whether or not the opposition would add to defence spending or would not add to defence spending. Uh, we've had different statements from different spokespeople on different days. The Leader of the Opposition has said different things at different times. Well, that kind of incompetence cannot be allowed to prevail. The opposition now has the opportunity to be crystal clear about its statements on defence and crystal clear about budgeting about defence and matching savings should they determine uh, to make extra expenditure. And I would uh, indicate, for example, they have uh, made commitments uh, about indexation of military superannuation that have not been properly accounted for. The Prime Minister will resume her seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister was asked about her uh, putting national security at risk because of her failure to deliver the service General. in 2012-13. She's now spending again her whole answer talking about the opposition. Manager, she wasn't the manager asked of about opposition the opposition business policies. will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call and will return to the question before the chair. Order! The Prime Minister has the call. 
Thank you very much. Uh, the government uh, will outline the defence white paper. The government's budget for defence is as I've outlined it. If the opposition wants to be taken seriously on this question, it needs to be crystal clear about its policy statements, crystal clear about costings and crystal clear about matching statement, sta savings, uh, given the uh, completely contradictory statements to date. No one at this point can take the opposition seriously on defence. Is the, the member for Fadden seeking to table a document? I am, Madam Speaker. I seek leave to table page 82 of the draft defence white paper that doesn't have the early member working for draft. Fadden is completely will complete. Is well seat. The, the member for Fadden will resume his seat. The leader of the house, I know, got up, but I hadn't given him the call. The leader of the house, my apologies. No. Could I remind members that when they have been told they no longer have the call, they no longer have the call. The member for Robinson has the call. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is implementing its plan to secure the future health and well-being of all Australians? The Minister for Health has the call. Uh, thank you so much, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for Robertson for her question. Since 2007, Labor has delivered stronger health services, and our plans for the future are very clear. More doctors, more nurses, more allied health professionals, more beds, less waiting, building and rebuilding our hospitals and GP services, expanded primary care, cheaper medicines, dental care, Aston. cancer prevention and services. Um, when I heard that Real Solutions was coming out, I thought I'd better set some time aside to read the health section, but as it happens, I, I, I didn't need very much time at all. Um, it's uh, uh, <laughs> very, uh, uh, not much plan there. One page list of slogans, but you know you only need to look at the states to uh, be the able to for read Aston the tea leaves. In Queensland, cuts of $1.6 billion. In Victoria, $616 million cut. We're investing in reducing waiting times for hospital patients with uh, projects like the $15 million to expand the surgery centre at the Heidelberg Repatriation yeah, yeah. Hospital in Victoria that was opened earlier this month, part of more than a billion dollars in capital and facilitation money to reduce emergency department and elective surgery waiting times. However, we see, in fact, that despite this new investment, times in states like Victoria have been going backwards for a year longer waiting times in emergency and longer lists for elective surgery. We're putting primary care in the hands of local communities through Medicare Locals. The uh, Shadow Minister said he wants to slash thousands of jobs from Medicare Locals—doctors, nurses, allied health professionals. We've seen uh, the rebuilding uh, and uh, uh, that's on top of, obviously, um, the cuts in Queensland—4,000 health workers cut by Campbell Newman. We're building and rebuilding hospitals and GP clinics. Just this morning, I turned the first sod on the new Canberra GP super clinic. Uh, and um, more recently, I was in Gosford with the member for Robertson looking at her beautiful uh, new site for a GP super clinic up there. And dental care, $5 billion invested in dental care over coming years, $2.7 billion so that 3.4 million kids can see a dentist as easily as they now see a GP, and almost $2 billion extra into public dental that's already taking people off waiting lists in the ACT, Tasmania, South Australia and very soon in New South Wales. Real Solutions has a lot of aspirations, it has a lot of slogans. Uh, but no, not much detail there. In fact, I've seen uh, more detail in a fortune cookie in the last week. Thanks. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Trade and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister on the Asian Century. I refer Order. the Minister to page 83 of the Australia and the Asian Century White Paper, in which it claims one of the government's achievements is, and I quote, returning the budget to surplus. <laughs> Has the minister written to his counterparts in Asia to correct this false claim, and has he apologised for making it? Yeah. The Minister for Trade has the call. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> After 1,099 days, I've finally got a question on policy yeah. from the opposition. From the opposition. 
On the weekend, I celebrated three years since I last had a question from the opposition, and therefore I welcome it with open arms. I welcome the fact that the Gillard Labor government has developed a sophisticated plan to engage Australia in the opportunities presented by the Asian century, where we will have, by 2030, three billion middle-class customers in Asia as we diversify our economy. Of course, we will continue to sell gas and minerals. The minister will resume his seat. The minister will resume his seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Madam Speaker, at the risk of encouraging the Minister to break into karaoke, I do ask that he address the question, has he apologised for the false claim The Deputy claim Leader of the Opposition the will resume her yeah. seat. The Minister has the call. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Speaker. And of course, this engagement will mean we diversify our economy into services, back into agriculture, and into sophisticated manufactured goods as we take advantage of regional supply chains. The Australian economy is the envy of the world. Is the envy of the world. And when it comes to the budget position of the Australian economy, we are achieving the most rapid fiscal consolidation in Australia's history. In Australia's history. We do not and will not accept the economic policies prescriptions of the Leader of the Opposition on budget policy, on budget policy, on which I could not be more relevant. The, the Leader of the Opposition's prescription to the question. on budget policy is that he, had, he wondered why we would not go down the New Zealand path, which was a path to recession. The minister, At all times, the Labor the government for will trade put will jobs first. His seat. The member for McKellar will resume her seat. The minister has the call and will refer to the question before the chair. The question, speaker, the minister has the question the call. speaker, is about budget policy and surpluses. And surpluses. And I am indicating that this government is achieving the most rapid fiscal consolidation in Australia's history. The could member be more relevant. The, the, the minister resumes. Said the member for McKellar. One point of order on relevance has already been taken on the question. The minister will resume his seat. The member for McKellar on a point of order. Yes, I, I refer you, Madam Speaker, to page 566 of the practice, where it says, "Where a minister is unable to provide a substantive answer, he should take it on notice. The he should take on notice the member for why McKellar he put in the data stream for surplus and." Seat. The member for McKellar is abusing again points of order. The, the member might buzz off if he's not careful. The minister has the call. The minister has the call. So thank you, uh, Speaker. On the specific issue of budget policy, we are achieving this rapid fiscal consolidation. We are doing it ahead of every major advanced country on earth. On earth. And we will always put jobs first. We will not go down the coalition pathway of a recession, which the opposition leader recommended. He said he did not know what was wrong with going down the, the New Zealand minister path, will which was a path to, to recession. The and on budget policy, on surpluses, we will always put we will always put the interests of the working men and women of Australia first. We have done that before. We will do it again because this is a Labor government that believes in the working men and women of this country, not the reckless, highly irresponsible the policies that the coalition has always seat. embraced. The minister will resume his seat. Is the Deputy Leader of the Opposition seeking to table a document? Um, clearly the Minister hasn't read his own white paper, the so I seek to table The Deputy page Leader of the Opposition can come to the point without use of abuse. I table page 83 of the white paper, order. which claims that the government the Deputy Leader of the Opposition returning will resume the budget to surplus. Seat. There is no need to table a document that has already been tabled. The member for Blair. The member for Blair has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Industry and Innovation. What are abattoirs and meat processors doing to save costs and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? How do their actions contrast with the predictions about the impact of the carbon price on the sector? 
the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency has the call. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the uh, member for Blair for his question. He's been very active in relation to this issue in particular. And of course, members of the House will recall the prophecies of doom and gloom made by the coalition in relation to carbon pricing and how it would operate in the meat processing sector. And guess what? The doom and gloom hasn't transpired. We had Senator Joyce claim that a leg of lamb had cost $100. We had other claims by the coalition that for each head of cattle admitted to an abattoir, it had cost $575,000, 575000 each. And of course, it's all garbage, it's all rubbish, it's all been totally deceitful and misleading, all the rubbish that's gone on from the other side about this issue. The reality is that the government has worked very closely with the meat industry in applying the carbon price within the industry, and it's leading to new investment in new technologies that will cut electricity consumption, reduce emissions intensity, cut greenhouse gas emissions and improve productivity and competitiveness. In making those, those commitments, the industry has worked with government and various grants are being provided to various abattoirs that support the investments that are being made. For example, in January this year, I announced, along with the member for Blair, a $4.4 million grant to JBS Australia for its Dinmore abattoir facility and meat processing plant. The result of that is that JBS will slash its electricity costs by $1.1 million a year by covering its settlement ponds, capturing the methane and generating electricity for its site. The emissions intensity, that is the amount of pollution produced per kilo of beef, will be reduced by 81 per cent. 81 per cent less pollution per kilo of beef from that particular facility at Dinmore. The payback period for the company's investment is only two years, two years to pay back the investment that it's making, to start to get a return on this investment. A very similar project is being undertaken uh, by AJ Bush and Sons at its Bromelton meat processing plant, accompanied by a $6.1 million grant from the government. That investment will cut Bromelton's energy costs by 46 per cent a year and reduce its emissions intensity by 64 per cent. These are quite extraordinary productivity and environmental outcomes through the application of the carbon price in the meat processing industry. And guess what else? They'll all be abolished by the other side. I mean, the cow cockies will be down here arguing, the for, these to be kept. To arguing for these to be kept. The position the opposition has is so ridiculous, so environmentally absurd and so economically irresponsible they will be under pressure from people on their own side of politics to keep the carbon price in place. The so-called pledge to get the rid of it is simply not credible. Has expired. The member for Blair on a supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The minister has talked about the impact of carbon price on industry. How is the carbon price impacting in other sectors, and how is industry responding? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency has the call. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Speaker. It's an excellent question, supplementary by the member for Blair, because this experience is being replicated in many other parts of industry. With the application of the carbon price and the disposition of carbon price revenue towards innovative techniques, the capturing of emissions, reductions of emissions intensity in manufacturing businesses, reductions in electricity consumption, improvements in productivity and competitiveness, we are starting to see a transformation in various industries in this country. And it is precisely what is necessary, precisely what is necessary to reduce the emissions intensity of our economy overall and to square up to our international responsibilities in tackling climate change. Who in their right mind would imagine that our number one trading partner, China, which is introducing a carbon price through an emissions trading scheme arrangement, through an emissions trading scheme arrangement, and with whom they wish to link our emissions trading schemes, who in their right mind, and exercising any semblance of economic responsibility, would imagine that Australia could simply sit around and do nothing, as advocated by the coalition. The proposition that the opposition leader has put forward to the community that this is all the death and destruction of the Australian economy is not only totally ridiculous and now proved demonstrably to be so, to be so but the proposition also that it be repealed 
is equally absurd. The minister's time has expired. The Prime Minister is seeking the call. Uh, thank you very much. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The Manager of Opposition Business is seeking the call. Order! The Manager of Opposition Business is seeking the call. Well, Madam Speaker, the standing orders state that the question time finishes at 10 past three. We've had this debate before on two occasions. On both occasions, the Leader of the House has agreed with my contention that, that question time finishes at 10 past three. The call is due to the, the opposition. The member for Canning was on his feet. Therefore, the call should have been given to the member for Canning, not the to the manager Prime Minister. Of opposition business will resume his seat. Just before I call the Leader of the House, the member for Cowan indicated he had a question to me. I will just deal with this now, please. The member for Cowan. Uh, the member for Cowan has the call. And I have and I have I have dealt with the issue before. I will not engage in argument. The member for Cowan has the call. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, questions on notice numbers uh, 1193 and 1194, which were submitted to the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs on the 10th of September 2012. Uh, given that it has been 134 days without a response, uh, could you ask the minister to reply, please? I will write to the minister in accordance with the standing orders.